Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is John S. Ray's 1961 European Vacation. This was originally published as Zook Family, Family Memories Collection, or ZFMC, number four, published in, on October 27, 1987. This is a diary of a trip my father took with my mother, Ruth Ray, and their friends, Wayne and Ann Duff. Of course, uh, if you recall from the uh, John S. Ray Oberlin College Diaries, John Ray and, and Wayne Duff became good friends at Oberlin College. October 6, 1961. After the expected last-minute rush, Red, now that was he called my, called my mother Red, her name was Ruth, Red and I met the Duffs at Cleveland Hopkins Airport, and we caught the 4.30 p.m. United flight for New York City. This seems to be a connecting flight for international trips, since there were folks going all over the world on the airplane. Mary Pickford and Buddy Rogers were on our plane, and after we arrived at Idlewild, she called me to take her arm so she wouldn't fall while getting on the escalator. She is in her middle 60s and said she had taken several falls recently. Wayne's cousin Cornell Duff and his small daughter Cassie met us at Idlewild. We very much enjoyed being with them while waiting for our flight to Ireland. At 10.30 p.m., our Irish Airlines Aer Lingus jet Bridget departed Idlewild Wild for Shannon. This is a large, beautifully appointed jet carrying 150 persons. The jet sound is not loud inside the airplane. Three persons sit side by side on each side of the aisle. We had a drink of Irish whiskey and are trying to settle down for the short night. October 7th. After having dinner on the plane last night and setting our watches ahead five hours, there was not much left of the night. Our average air speed for the trip over was about 730 miles per hour, and we traveled at 33,000 feet. Our first glimpse of Ireland from the air resembled a green patchwork quilt. It had apparently just stopped raining before we arrived at Shannon. The weather is cool. After arriving at Shannon, we found that one of the Duff's bags and one of our bags were still in New York. We hope they will catch up with us tomorrow in Cork. We spent several hours shopping in the large tax-free shop at the Shannon Airport. Our conclusion was that it was not a particularly good deal, except that a few items were supposedly not available elsewhere in Ireland. The weather cleared beautifully this morning, and we started driving in our rented Wolseley car with the leopard skin seat covers. The steering wheel is on the right, and you drive on the left. The Irish countryside is beautifully green. There are many bikes and people walking on the road. Many small two-wheel carts drawn by horse or donkey. In Limerick, the driving was rather confusing with cars, trucks, bicycles, carts, and pedestrians everywhere. The houses in town are very different looking. Some have thatched roofs. All are low and quite close together. The children have pink cheeks, as do most of the adults. Although the folks seem happy, they also seem quite poor, or at least have a much lower standard of living. Just outside Limerick, we stopped and went through Bunratty Castle. This is the only castle in Ireland which has been restored and is really worth seeing. It had about five different levels, many narrow, winding stairways. It was here that one of the O'Briens was pulled into by horses, owned by the de Clares. It cost some 45,000 Irish pounds to restore and furnish the castle. We drove to Adair for lunch at the Dunreven Arms Hotel. There are many ruins in this area which are all of gray stone and very picturesque. We took a long walk through the grounds of the castle of Lord Dunreven. Beautiful old ruins, buckeye trees, many trees which appeared to be several hundred years old. Red's back bothered her because her low shoes are in the bag we do not have yet. We saw several barrel wagons of gypsies. Each country house seems to have its own haymow and peat pile. There are many, many crows. We arrived this evening in Killarney and Great Southern Hotel, a picturesque little town. Chemists, victuallers, meat markets, pub, postcard store, chemists, etc. Many bicycles and many, many crows. We're quite, quite tired, so to bed early. October 8th. 
This morning, Sunday, we went to 8 o'clock a.m. service at Church of Ireland, which is in communion with the Protestant Episcopal Church of the USA. The, the church is so old that it is, that it is not known when it was first built. There were only about 12 persons present. Anne Duff said the Catholic Church was jammed. It rained on and off several times this morning and then turned into a beautiful day. We drove around the lakes of Killarney, which are very beautiful. In the distance can be seen McGillicuddy's Reeks, which are the highest mountains in Ireland. We drove out about six miles from Killarney to Lover's View through the lakes, lakes area which include Loch Lean. The Irish names are really different. The names of some of the towns are real blockbusters, e.g. Cahir Savine, Abbeyfield, Park Nasilla. We then took the famous Ring of Kerry Drive, which is a wildly beautiful drive through County Kerry in the southwest corner of Ireland. This is a desolate section abutting on the Atlantic Ocean and as poor as it is beautiful. There were a number of peat bogs that could be seen and many piles of peat. We stopped at the thatch roof cottage of Mona Moran and she let us look inside. A peat fire was burning inside and the floor was stone. She was single and cared for her sick father. The Irish folks speak very softly and it's quite a pleasure to listen to them. There is quite an argument going on in Ireland as to whether the Irish children should be taught Gaelic. Almost all signs are in both English and Gaelic. We stopped for a cup of Irish coffee at Park Nasilla, a summer resort hotel which closes next week. There are palm trees and bamboo trees growing here, and the temperature seldom goes below 60 degrees. It was almost dark when we arrived at Blarney Castle, and we found it closed, so we drove on into Cork and checked into the Imperial Hotel. This is the third largest city in Ireland and quite busy. We had our first really fine meal in Ireland this evening at the hotel. The cook learned his trade in Germany. Our two lost bags caught up with us this evening and we drove around Cork after picking up the bags. It appeared that the entire population had gone downtown by foot to see the movies. The Irish cooking is no good. Everything is quite bland and everything tastes about the same. The trifle, which is a dessert, however, is excellent, just as it was in New Zealand. October 9th. Today was overcast, and it rained most of the time. However, we did not mind. The temperature was moderate, and the rain gentle. We went straight out to Blarney Castle this morning and thoroughly enjoyed our visit. The castle is 120 feet high, very picturesque, and we climbed to the top on the winding circular staircases. The famous Blarney Stone is part of one of the outside walls on the very top of the castle, and we all kissed it. There are relatively few ruins in this area, and the terrain is rather similar to central Ohio. The highway is narrow, and the sharp turn after dark driving can be dangerous. We drove to Dublin via Eugel, Waterford, and New Ross. In New Ross, we had a flat tire. President John F. Kennedy's grandfather emigrated to the USA from there. We checked several of the places where teas were advertised, and it appears that the hotels are by far the best places to eat. We stopped for tea and biscuits in one little town, and the policeman said they had two hotels and neither was much good. We have been assailed several times by Irish mothers with babes in arms begging for money to feed their children. It was 9 o'clock p.m. by the time we arrived at Shelbourne Hotel in Dublin. This town seems much, much more sophisticated than anything we have seen. October 10th. We're certainly enjoying our visit in Dublin. This is an excellent hotel. One, one unusual breakfast item is the small baked potato. Our guide, Mr. Dillon, came at 9.30 a.m. and we had an excellent tour of the city. The sun was out and the air soft. I'm getting used to driving on the left, but I'm still not used to walking across the street. We keep looking the wrong way for cars. We saw the old Parliament buildings with no windows, now the Bank of Ireland, Phoenix Park, Guinness Brewery, Dublin Castle, which is being converted into the government buildings, home of the American Ambassador, Trinity College of University of Dublin, and the Book of Kells. There are more than 500,000 people in Dublin. 
Many have red hair and wear green tweeds. The River Liffey runs through town and is dirty. The town bustles with activity. I, we talk with a lady policeman. There are 18 here in Dublin and 6 in Cork. She earns 9 pounds per week and is happy. The Irish and English money are interchangeable here, but not in England. Water is not served at meals unless requested. Red bought a lovely tweed skirt today. We had a delicious dinner at Russell Restaurant, a French establishment. After dinner, we went to the Abbey Theatre and saw two fine plays. Both highlighted the differences between the Orange Men in the six counties of Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic. The differences appear to be largely emotional. We enjoyed more Irish coffee this evening. This is made of Irish whiskey, coffee, and cream. We enjoyed our ride on the green double-decker bus this morning. We have apparently enjoyed exceptionally good weather in Ireland. Three of the four days have been perfect weather-wise. The bad weather was on a day when it didn't matter. I think it's fair to say that our overall impression of Ireland has been very good, and we would like to return another time to see more. We are very grateful to Mr. White's for having told us to do our own driving and to spend more time in Dublin as opposed to seeing Belfast. October 11th. This morning, Red and I got up early and raced around doing some last-minute shopping. Our 10.30 a.m. Aer Lingus flight to Glasgow was pleasant and took only one hour. Our first view of Scotland from the air looked like Ireland in that there is much greenness and the country is divided into small, irregularly shaped farms. The weather was bright and clear for our flight, but as soon as we stepped off the airfield in Scotland, it started to pour. It is much colder here and rained on and off all day. Our driver for the day, Mr. Stevenson, met us at the airport with a large Volkswagen, and we had a good day with him driving to Edinburgh. Although Ireland was neutral during World War II, Scotland was not, and Glasgow was heavily bombed because of its shipyards. The Scottish taxpayers are still paying for it. Glasgow is Scotland's largest city. We drove north from Renfrew Airport across the River Clyde by ferry, past Gair Loch and along Loch Lomond. The waters of Lomond are deep and black, and the scenery beautiful with the mountain background. Then through the very beautiful and wild Trossachs region. We missed the heather by about three weeks, but the withered and brown break. The mountains and pine trees are lovely. The homes seem to be almost universally, uniformly gray with an occasional painted door. Scotland is more industrialized than Ireland. The pointed haystacks and chimney tops are quite picturesque. Lunch at Cairn du Hotel, very nice. Hotel Caledonia is the best in town. After a good dinner and a short walk, we're off to the sack. The weather is quite brisk this evening. October 12th. There are just over 500,000 people here in Edinburgh and very little in industry. The town is steeped in history and culture. We can see Edinburgh Castle from our hotel window. It looks over the town below from a high, rocky vantage point. After breakfast, our chauffeur and guide for the day met us. There are several beautiful parks in the downtown area. The main street is Prince's Street. A large spire to Sir Walter Scott is close to our hotel. We went through St. Giles Presbyterian Church, which was formerly Roman Catholic. It has a little room to one side where the Order of the Thistle meets. This is a group of 16 persons, and the membership quite select. We passed the home of John Knox and went all around and all through Edinburgh Castle, where a Scottish garrison now headquarters. This formerly was the entire city of Edinburgh and has a number of buildings. It goes back 900 years. We went through Holyrood Castle where Mary, Queen of Scots, lived and saw the room where her friend Rizzio was murdered by her second husband, Darnley. Our guide made Mary's tragic life, tragic life come to life for us. The Scottish ca castle guards wear kilts, but they are seldom seen elsewhere in Scotland. The Scottish folks seem much more industrious than the Irish, and they are certainly much more prosperous. There is coal here, but not in Ireland. 
The main Scottish industries are shipbuilding and whiskey. This afternoon we drove out to the Sir Walter Scott country and saw his beloved River Tweed and his home Abbotsford. You could almost feel the presence of the great Scott. The surrounding country is very beautiful and fertile. Oats, barley, wheat, and sugar beets are grown. Some of the world's finest cattle are grown here. We saw several flocks of green plovers and a large salmon jump, jump out of the river Tweed. And we saw several gall-worthy cattle, which are white cattle with about a two-foot ring of black all around them. We still get no water with our meals unless we ask for it. And the brown sugar in our coffee does not seem quite right. Had green gauge plum preserves on our toast this morning. The town chimneys are all covered with chimney pots. Very little doing after supper, which is all right with us. The weather was perfectly beautiful all day. This is the home of Alexander Graham Bell and many important medical man, e.g. Dr. Lister. October 13th. The weatherman smiled on us again today. Red and I did our last-minute shopping in Edinburgh. We then picked up our Ford console and started for Windermere, England. Southern Scotland is quite beautiful with its streams and hills. At one point we saw a fisherman walking along the road, carrying a fish so large its tail was dragging on the ground. We stopped at Galatiel's and Red finally found some red plaid kilts for Pamela and Patricia. It's good sport just to walk around these small towns and look around and talk with the people. We saw many, many young mothers out walking their babies in expensive-looking perambulators. At Havoc, we stopped for afternoon tea at a delightful little hotel. Very pleasant. The Scottish food is better than the Irish. As we continued on south from Edinburgh, we didn't even know when we entered England. We saw a small herd of sheep dyed golden yellow. The houses are getting somewhat larger, but still drab gray in color. After dark, we arrived in our hotel near Windermere and had an excellent dinner. I'm anxious to see what this place looks like in daylight. October 14th. This morning dawned foggy and cloudy, cloudy over Lake Windermere. We walked around the shops in the picturesque little resort town of Bo. Bones, bounds, and started driving. The immediate area was quite hilly and beautiful, but as we continued south, the country flattened out. We drove along Blackpool's Promenade, England's Coney Island, and had a delightful snack at a small place on the water. Then on to visit Jenny and Ben Rowley in Wigan. They have a good-looking, red-haired young man, Paul. They're very good folks, and we had a good visit with them. Ben has a brother, James Rowley, in Lakewood, Ohio, whom, whom we intend to call up. The area around and including Wigan has an extremely dense population, much smoke and smog. The traffic is very heavy, and the train much like that at home. After dark, we finally located our lodgings here at the Craxton Wood Country Club. We called home and found the children well, but Mrs. Vogler apparently tiring a bit. October 15th. This morning dawned very foggy again. It didn't clear until about noon. In the meantime, we had driven into Wales. The names here are really something, and the houses are very picturesque, somewhat reminiscent of Ireland. Salmon and trout fishing here are good. After leaving Wales, we continued on back into England, and it started fogging up again around 3.30 p.m. The people say this is somewhat unusual but the heavy industrial complex in the area continues to cause dense smoke. We arrived at the Shakespeare Hotel at Stratford-on-Avon just before dark. This place has the real old English look and is alive with atmosphere. Both the waitress and bartender have an excellent sense of humor. October 16th. This morning dawned bright and clear and remains so all day. I located a man this morning who fixed our camera again, and I hope it stays fixed this time. Stratford-upon-Avon is extremely picturesque, with its many brown and white vertical-striped buildings. The whole town seems to be built around Shakespeare, who was born and died here, William Shakespeare. We visited his birthplace on Henley Street, Anne Hathaway's cottage before her marriage to him, 
the home where his daughter Susanna and her husband lived, Mary Arden's house where Shakespeare's mother lived, and the remains of the home where Shakespeare lived. There was money on both sides of the family, and he was a wealthy man in his lifetime. The ten years he spent in London, away from his wife and children, are still not documented. No one knows for sure what he was doing. From Stratford we drove down toward London, and stopped for a most interesting tour of Blenheim Castle. The place cost 300,000 pounds to build over 200 years ago, and the furnishings are unbelievably expensive. Many original Van Dykes, a Rembrandt and a Sargent, an enormous tin organ, a 12,000 volume library and private chapel. Winston Churchill was born here, and the present Duke of Marlborough lives there. What a place! We drove around the grounds and buildings at Oxford outside London and saw several anti-Yank and anti-war signs painted on walls. On into London and our plush hotel Westbury, we are spending entirely too much on food and drink. However, this noon we had hamburgers in Stratford. We drove a little over 600 miles from Edinburgh to London. We have no particular desire to drive through the English countryside again, although we would certainly like to see more of Ireland. October 17th. This morning it was raining when we started touring with our guide and car. London is still in the process of being rebuilt from the severe bombings of World War II. About 28,000 Londoners were killed in the bombings. First we went to the Tower of London and saw the Royal Jewels. This is a truly tremendous display, and no value could possibly be placed upon them. We noticed the ravens on the grounds before our guide pointed them out. The English have the deepest feeling of devotion to their monarch. Many school children were also visiting the tower the same time as ourselves, in spite of the rain. The tower goes back some 900 years. Then to St. Paul's Cathedral, the number one Episcopal church in the world. Its history goes back 1,300 years. Red and I climbed to the Whispering Gallery, and it really works. It was hit by bombs during World War II and is now being repaired. On to Westminster Abbey, which is breathtaking. The interior is now being cleaned, and the cleaning makes a tremendous difference. The number of world-famous persons buried there is too long to even start. The coronations take place there. The Stone of Scone is safely beneath the coronation chair. This abbey is an absolute must for anyone visiting London. We could not see the changing of the guard today because of the weather. This evening we saw an excellent play at Piccadilly Theatre, The Amorous Prawn. Very delightful. The theatre is just off P Piccadilly Circus, which was a real beehive of, of activity. We have decided to watch our expenditures more closely because the English have been fleecing us. October 18th. This morning was quite chilly as we walk, watched the changing of the guard for more than an hour in front of Buckingham Palace. It is quite a routine and the horse soldiers make it very colorful. Then on to Madame Tussaud's waxworks. Although some of the figures were excellent, we felt that most were not really good. Then we relaxed for 45 minutes in the planetarium next door. We have been eating in smaller, less, less expensive places and enjoying our meals just as much. Brown sugar is always served on the table, and water served only on request. A small baked tomato usually turns up at each meal. Prices in the stores seem to be higher on nearly everything than they are at home. This makes shopping difficult. This evening we saw a perfectly tremendous vaudeville show at the famous Palladium Theatre. It was really great. This afternoon we took a ride on the London subway deep underground. The escalator down was the longest I have ever seen. October 19th. This morning we shopped and shopped. This is tough because the same things are better and cheaper at home. However, we hit the jackpot when we visited the cashmere store suggested by our guide and bought six sweaters. Then Red continued shopping and I went to the law courts. I sat for some time in the rear balcony of one of the Queen's bench courts and heard the conclusion of a negligence case. The lawyers, judge, and bailiff all wear white wigs and black robes, and I really got a kick out of it. 
the rules of evidence seemed surprisingly relaxed, and the courtroom ancient and musty. This evening we had a delightful dinner in Oxford Circus, which is very close to Piccadilly Circus, and we had some unexpected sidewalk entertainment just outside the restaurant. This evening at 10 o'clock p.m., our train for Paris, France, left Victoria Station. Our compartment adjoins the Duffs, and although they are small, they are adequate. Because of rough seas, there is some question whether we will be able to start crossing the English Channel at midnight as scheduled. October 20th. We slept like rocks last night and were awakened by the swaying and rolling of the boat. Our train is put right on the ferry boat. The seas were rough last night, and instead of leaving Dover to start the channel crossing at midnight, we did not start until 7 o'clock a.m. We enjoyed looking out over the waters of the of the English Channel from the boat this morning in a light rain. We went through one lock and docked at Dunkirk, France. Our train was promptly removed from the boat, but then forgotten about for some time. An engine and restaurant car finally arrived and we continued on to Paris. The French countryside does not seem remarkable, but many of the houses seem quite small and high. Lunch was served on the train with wine, beer, and liqueurs. Excellent! Many new apartment buildings rise up as we approach Paris. On to Hotel Maurice, which is a delightful place. The French francs are worth about 20 cents each. Immediately after checking into the hotel at 4.10 p.m. rather than 9 o'clock a.m. as scheduled, we set out to have a look at the fabled city. The place has loads of atmosphere, many fascinating and very expensive little shops. Lots of people running around. The girls put lots of goop on their faces and have some wild hairdos. Our reservations at the Lido for this evening were confirmed, so we went at 9.30 p.m. What a place! It advertises as the most famous nightclub in the world. The place was jammed. It will accommodate a thousand people. The food was good, the prices very high, and the girls had no shirts. October 21st. The weather was clear and reasonably warm for our sightseeing today. Our hotel is across the street from the Tuileries, a large and very beautiful park for the private use of the French kings several hundred years ago. First we went to the Louvre, which is an enormous place and the former palace of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. I was as much impressed with this as anything we've seen. We admired the Venus de Milo, the Winged Victory, the Mona Lisa, and many other priceless art treasures. From there to the beautiful chapel of Louis IX with its gorgeous 700-year-old stained glass windows. Notre Dame Cathedral is impressive from the outside, but the stained glass inside is not so good. Many of the stained glass windows and heads of kings were broken and knocked off during the French Revolution. The replacement windows are not nearly so beautiful because the art of making the blue glass in 1145 had been lost. We went by the Sorbonne, Montparnasse, where the art students live, and up to Montmartre for an open-air brunch in the midst of all the beatnik artists and their paintings. This is an, is an extremely picturesque and at the same time very phony neighborhood. We had lunch with the Duffs and our guide and our guide, and were outrageous, outrageously overcharged for a late lunch, $16 for five persons. The traffic moves very fast here. There's a very large open area at the end of the Tuileries where flags of various nations are flown at appropriate times. There are assorted monuments to Napoleon Bonaparte all over town, and his grave is a real monster. There are some excellent planning by Napoleon in laying out the city, Le Champs-Élysées with its Arc de Triomphe at one end and the Arc de Carousel at the other is a good example. The Eiffel Tower is much larger than I thought. Paris is a beautiful city and there are many, many wonderful things to see and do. We are astounded at the high price of food and, and most other things. However, we bought our Swedish stainless steel here today at a good price. Tonight we had reservations at Moulin Rouge. Similar to the Lido, but not quite so crowded. We both enjoyed it. October 22nd. Another lovely morning in Paris, France. 
After breakfast, we had a pleasant walk through the Tuileries. Some of the flowers are still in bloom. We visited the modernist buildings of the Louvre at one end of the Tuileries. They have a tremendous collection of originals by Van Gogh, Toulouse-Lautrec, Cezanne, Gauguin, Monet, and others. All most enjoyable. We finished our last bit of Paris shopping and left for Paris International Airport and the flight home. The flight from Paris to New York took exactly eight hours and was smooth. We gained five hours on our watches, so this day we'll have 29 hours. We arrived in New York on time and had no difficulty with customs. We found that although the duffs were confirmed from Idlewild to Newark by helicopter that we were not. However, we had a very enjoyable ride over to Newark in a small private plane and connected with our United, United jet to Cleveland. This certainly has been a tremendous trip. On the financial side, when we left Cleveland, our assets were $602 and my good luck piece. The remains are the good luck piece. Looking forward to seeing the family. The end. John S. Ray. Now there's a newspaper article here I'd like to read by Bob Seltzer from the, Cle- from the Cleveland Plain Dealer from 1962. Quote, The millennium for John Stuart Ray, father of four small children, will come when the world forecloses the possibility of one nation making war upon another. Ray, an attorney, is president of the Greater Cleveland Chapter, United World Federalists. This international organization is supporting a program of world peace through world law by strengthening the United Nations. Quote, a quote by John S. Ray. The Soviet offensive military buildup of Cuba into a nuclear strike base certainly points up the need for the rule of force to be replaced by the rule of law, said John Ray. Our sole objective is to avoid another world war. It would be the last, for it would destroy mankind. We recognize that there are many dif- difficulties in achieving our goal, but they are small compared with the stakes involved. We have, an enor- we have an enormous responsibility to our children and grandchildren. World law would pertain only to those things that relate to war. The world court must have power to enforce its decrees. We are unalterably opposed to the Connolly Amendment, which stipulates that the U.S. first must determine whether to submit to the court's jurisdiction. A congressional poll shows that from 70 to 80 percent of the public favors strengthening the United Nations. Our organization endorsed 100 percent the U.S. purchase of up to $100 million of U.N. bonds if matched dollar for dollar by other U.N. members. Ours is a political action group enlisting public support for our objectives and seeking to influence Congress. We are prolific letter writers. The UWF was primarily responsible for persuading Congress to create the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Ray said the UWF does not advocate unilateral disarmament and believes the United States must remain militarily strong until disarmament proposals can be worked out in detail. As nations disarm by carefully controlled stages, The U.N. must be bolstered militarily into an international peace force, not a police force. International peace force. Nations would not give up national sovereignty, but only the right to make war on each other. Individual nations would retain arms necessary only to control internal affairs. Ray, 38, is a big man, 6 feet 2 inches and 195 pounds. He is earnest, scholarly looking, and an eloquent, eloquent evangelist of peace. Elected president of the UWF chapter in October 1960, he is directing a drive to expand membership to 1,000 from the present 700. A native of Marion, Ohio, Ray graduated from Marion Harding High School and Oberlin College and was a cum laude graduate of Cleveland Marshall Law School. His law firm is Myers, Stevens, and Ray. Ray became interested in UWF while he was president of the Cleveland Junior Chamber of Commerce. He served as chairman of the chapter's Speakers Bureau and first vice president. The family that Ray hopes to save from a world nuclear holocaust lives at 20689 Beechcliff Boulevard, Rocky River. His wife is Ruth, and their children are Mark, age 9, Pamela, 8, Patricia, Ann, 4, and Peter, 2. Now we have three comments. The first is by Helen Lacey, 
the uh, sister of John S. Ray's mother, uh, and she says this, quote, The diary of your trip to the British Isles and Paris came at a very good time for reading and enjoyment. I read and enjoyed your fine account of your trip with the Duffs, Helen Zook Lacey, Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And the second is from John S. Ray, the author, quote, This ZFMC brought back many forgotten memories of a great trip with our very good friends, the Duffs. John S. Ray, Rocky River, Ohio. And the last is from uh, Isabel Stevens, my, my godmother and the wife of Dick Stevens, my dad's uh, law partner. Quote, I enjoyed very much reading your father's diary of the European trip in 1961. It brought back fond memories of Dick's and my John in 1975, except that we visited only London, Wales, and Ireland. Isabel Stevens, Rocky River, Ohio. So this uh, concludes today's presentation. I called it the European trip. He basically, it was a trip to, uh, to Ireland, Scotland, England, Wales, and France. So uh, good luck to you with your efforts in family history and finding, if, if it interests you, in finding, preserving, and sharing old letters, diaries, and photographs, and interviewing elderly relatives while they're alive. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.